This conference will now be recorded. And I call this meeting to order. And, uh, we'll, we'll begin by looking at the, uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you probably already have a summary of the meeting from last time. So I want to invite anyone to offer any changes they'd like to or additions or corrections to that. Hi, Rebecca. Morning, Rhett. Any uh, anybody have any any changes they want to make? I read through it; it looks pretty accurate. If not, we'll move on. <clears throat> and can you pop the agenda up for starters, so we can briefly go over what we're going to be covering today? Uh, un, un, if I do that, Rut, unfortunately, I'm having some technical difficulties. I will have to end the meeting and restart it. I just discovered. No, I we don't. Want, we really do I'm really sorry. Are you going to be able to present later on, though? If we don't do that, take care of that now. Uh, I hope so. Or <laughs> I'll have Ma I'll have Matthew do it if I can't. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, just in in summary, I I assume uh, everyone has had a look at the agenda, but we're gonna have fortunately guests, uh, uh, Jacob Breiger from uh, Dr. Cog and David Singer from C CDOT here with us. And uh, to get an overview of front range passenger rail, which we'll discuss first. And then uh, RTD, and then a CARES Act funding document, which we'll, we'll discuss. And then uh, RTD's administrative over overhead review uh, from Ron and uh, accountability committee preliminary report, which uh, we will expect to be finalizing at, we'll have a meeting, I think it's on the 6th, is that right? Or our next one? And the then after meeting. that, we'll, not long after that will be the total complete RTD accountability committee uh, approval of the, of the uh, preliminary report. Yeah, next meeting is January 6th. So let's move on to the front range passenger rail overview. And um, I, I uh, David, are you the one or is Jacob presenting this? Chair, this is Jacob Rieger. I'm gonna start the presentation. David and I will do this together. Okay, tag team. Please okay. proceed. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having us. My name is Jacob Rieger. I am Dr. Cog's Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, and I'm also the Vice Chair of the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. Uh, with me today to do this, as I said, is David Singer uh, from CDOT. He's the CDOT uh, Project Manager for our blended team working on this project. And to help us answer questions, we also have our staff from the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission uh, Randy Grauberger and Spencer Dodge with us today as well. So I'm really just going to kick this off and turn this over to David. Uh, respecting your time today, we have a very short presentation. Each of these slides probably could be its own presentation. We're going to go through this quickly, uh, but happy to answer any questions or backfill any information that uh, that you're looking for. Great. So just to start, um, you know, kind of talking about the vision for Front Range Passenger Rail, and this is something that we've been working on for some time, um, extensive public and stakeholder um, engagement. You know, it's really important to get this right in terms of what is the purpose of this? What's the vision? What are we trying to solve? And really getting into the pre-NEPA and NEPA process, you know, where you need to be really clear about purpose and need uh, for a big project like this. So um, as it says, a safe, efficient, reliable transportation option, uh, for travel between major population centers and destinations. Our corridor that we're looking at is a 180 mile corridor um, stretching from Pueblo uh, to Fort Collins along our front range. Um, however, with the other work of the Southwest Chief and Front Range Rail Commission looking at Amtrak Southwest Chief Service, the real grand vision here, frankly, is to use the Southwest Chief and other components to connect the service um, down to Trinidad, Colorado, uh, we also have uh, extensive participation in our commission from folks from New Mexico and Wyoming. So frankly, our broader vision is eventually Cheyenne to New Mexico um, in this work, but our core sort of you know, pre-NEPA and NEPA work right now is Pueblo to Fort Collins. And obviously we wanna create a backbone for connections and expanding rail and transit options um, throughout the state. Um, and obviously, as I said, beyond the state. So we we're really looking for an interconnected system to serve the citizens and taxpayers of Colorado. 
Um, and with that, let me turn it over to my colleague, David Singer, to take us through the rest. Thank you, Jacob. So uh, for the past year plus, the blended team stakeholders have looked to better define that vision and give it some characteristics. And so you see here that um, it is its own standalone system and there are several alignments that can help achieve that vision. You see three different colored lines going up and down the corridor and technically all of them meet this vision. Um, each of them have nine primary stations knowing that we have to move quickly up and down the corridor, but as the option to, to add more um, <clears throat> as needed. Um, we've got uh, 24 trips desired for 2045 and, and that yields a substantial amount of ridership as you see we've used colorado statewide uh, travel model to to project uh, who might ride it where and what types of trips they're looking for and and what you would imagine is denver to boulder is the strongest pair there's an overwhelming interest in moving throughout the dr cog region uh, commuter trips ranked highest but there's also a desire for recreational and special events and in 2045 it provides a competitive travel time to an individual looking to uh, get in their car and drive up and down the corridor. And so that was, we understand we needed to have this perform well and, and make it a desirable choice. And once we're able to, to define this, we're able to put some very high level costs to build this. And we, we've seen from past experiences, if we put one number to you, then that number is what is ingrained in everyone's mind. We're very early on, we want to present a range. Um, with very uh, lots of variables and assumptions. Uh, next slide. Really what the focus is now that we understand where we wanna get to is those first steps. And so it's implementation of this vision. And what we've seen from across the country is successful projects, programs have done it in bites and you don't do it all at once. And so that's where we wanna do first. It, it does a couple of things. Number one, it's a minimal investment. Um, it creates a culture, it creates ridership, and it, it demonstrates a proof of concept. And so we're looking not to create new tracks, but looking within existing transportation corridors and, and trying to partner with um, our freight uh, partners. Uh, next slide, please. And so it looks a little bit differently depending on where you are in the corridor. From Fort Collins to Colorado Springs, maybe it's not 24 trips, but two to six trips. And this is looking along the freight line, uh, the BNSF specifically north of Denver. Uh, lesser speeds and still a large investment, but a fraction of this overall cost. Now, points south from the Springs to Pueblo, maybe one or two trains is adequate, knowing that it's less ridership and population down there. And the investment would be less too. And, and the, the Rail Commission has received a federal Chrissy grant to explore this starting this year it's called a, a through car service in partnership with Amtrak. Next slide, please. So Rail Commission staff, BNSF staff, RTD staff, CDOT staff have really started thinking in the past months on a technical level what this first step might be. And it's, we're using the peak service, the Northwest Rail Starter Service as our baseline. We know that, that BNSF and RTD have been thinking about these first similar model. And so we're looking at different variations. What would an express and a local service look like? What's the number of trips? Uh, and what's the, uh, the right size of stations to start off with? Um, we can then model the performance of that, understand the ridership. We can also model where that interaction is with passenger trains and freight trains to see where each of them get backed up and how they might impact each other's overall uh, performance. Um, we'll be thinking about getting in and out of Union Station. And then that model is successful. We can apply that to the unique characteristics of the end line going north and the southwest line getting south out of town, knowing it's a very constrained uh, metro area. Um, but the Rail Commission has also received a Chrissy grant for this exercise, and that will be starting off this summer and will keep us busy for the next year and a half, knowing what those viable first steps might be. Next slide, please. So all of that is to really illustrate the what of passenger rail. And we've got some very talented and eager engineers who would be happy to design this uh, if we just let them loose. But it's not just an engineering or a NEPA exercise. 
And so this slide really talks about the need to also concurrently advance the program elements. And so it's not just a rail commission vision, but it's a stakeholder vision, it's a community vision, it's, it's buy-in from in comprehensive plans and zoning choices and land use. And similarly, we have to also advance the policy aspects of, of passenger rail. And that's um, looking at the legislature and, and creating a governance. The rail commission has some powers, but not enough to operate this in perpetuity. And so we anticipate that a bill may be introduced this year that may um, look to create an authority or a district or an entity um, that's a better equipped to advance this. And finally, most importantly, is funding and finance. And our team has put together a memo laying out all the potential buckets of money and sources um, to help advance this, knowing that it, it will take uh, a number of sources, um, whether it's at the local level, uh, at the state level through a ballot. And we're also looking at the federal level for uh, potential authorizations or grant programs to help move this along. Um, next slide, please. So uh, in closing, uh, Colorado and the Front Range have been thinking about passenger rail for generations. And, and it continues today. There's, there's still a drumbeat. There's still very high enthusiasm and interest from our leadership and from the public, as you see in this poll. We've been reaching out to them in the past year and going back to 19 to understand what their desires are. And the Rail Commission is really trying to incorporate and reflect those desires in understanding what the viable options are for the front range. So um, that's the elevator pitch. Um, Jacob said, right, we can spend an hour on any of these slides, but I just wanted to kind of prime you and see if a uh, reaction or if there's any questions that any of the team can answer. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you for being here, uh, Jacob and David. I, I would want to, I did have a, a couple of questions that we could start off with. Uh, the, this initial billion and a half to two and a half billion um, phase one of the project, I, you you said into and out of Union Station. Where would the where would it start and where would it end, and or would it be two sets of round trips between, for example, Boulder and Union Station, or uh, Fort Collins and Union Station and and Pueblo and Union Station. I, I didn't quite, I wasn't quite clear on whether these were uh, two separate sort of routes. Yeah, we're still, you know, understanding the need for a one seat ride from top to bottom and where those opportunities are for continuity, but also understanding where transfers might need to be. Um, so for example, we're, our engineers are working with RTD about, if we are coming into a Union Station, how do we, I think, hook back south, um, uh, you know, whether it's um, those Amtrak lines underneath the canopy or looking further west to where the, the W line comes in. Uh, those are, kind of design details that we're still going to be spending the next year um, trying to understand the alternatives and the trade-offs. Okay. Uh, what was the high end of the... Of the uh, oh, right, of real quick. The eight, the eight billion to what? I, I was trying to catch that. And, and... Yeah, in both of these numbers, they're very preliminary and, and it was 14.2. And, and when we look at those are for all three um, alignments. They're very similar when we're, we're talking about this range in cost. So, you know, we did this exercise to understand differentiators. And at this high level, um, for each of these, it's a similar investment. Okay. Hmm. And you said the average speed was 70, uh, you said the maximum speed was 79 on the phase one. Uh, what would it be on this on this uh, larger vision? Uh, and what the would the average speed as opposed to the maximum speed be? Yeah. So would on the larger vision, the larger vision would have its own independent track, and so it could reach higher speeds. It wouldn't have to uh, interact with freight. 
And so we could still move at higher speeds. We're hoping 90 to 110. Now it, it depends on topography, you know, the, the curves going through the metro area up and down some of the hills and mountains along the range, but it's um, 90 to 110. And then for the first speed, I think we're, we're anticipating something um, lesser, only that the, the existing tracks may not have the ability to, um, to hit the higher speeds. But a lot of the average speed is going to be dictated by how often you stop and how long it takes you in a, in a station to unload and, and reload and take off again. Absolutely. So if you've got, what is it, nine stops, then how, how does that impact, you know, wh what would the time be to get from Pueblo to Fort Collins? Our, we plug in all of those assumptions into our, our transportation model, traffic model, and it, it did anticipate two and a half to three hours from top to bottom. And, you know, that is, um, as we add more stations, the number goes up, but it also uh, allows the ability to attract more folks. Um, right. And so we saw the average trip being 30 to 40 minutes, right? There's, the model didn't show uh, a lot of trips daily from Pueblo to Fort Collins. It, it's usually moving within regions. Um, right. So to, to answer your last question about average speeds, um, from these longer, straighter stretches, we are hitting those maximum speeds, but moving in and around populated areas with sharp curves, it's it's probably a lesser speed, closer to in, in the 50s or 60s, but but still is faster than um, a lot of the other modes in those same areas in 2045. Right. And if you if you look at this model and compare it to say a bus service that uh, covers the same uh, the same area, what are the clear advantages to rail over over say a, uh, a an alternative like the Flatiron Flyer or a series of those. I would say that the two of them complement each other. Certainly, um, the Flatiron Flyer has a dedicated lane and um, or the managed lanes in, in several instances. The passenger rail would too, but in a lot of places along the front range um, the same can't be said right that those those buses or similar services operating with mixed traffic now there is more and more managed lanes being introduced but at, at this point it's it's not a as as a reliable trip and when you look at the cost when you when you talk about the uh the high end you know the eventual vision uh, of the eight to 14 billion, does that include maintenance cost of the rail over a long period of time and the vehicles? It's a good question. The answer is uh, yes, these are the capital costs and that includes um, right of way fleet um, and um, the maintenance yards. There is an additional annual cost for operations and maintenance. And uh, is that included in the eight to nine, uh, eight fourteen, or is is that a cost that's after? What what's the operating cost going to be if if you if it were built tomorrow? What would it cost yearly to operate? Yeah, these are twenty twenty dollars, and uh, I'm weary. To, it was also using a range, and I um, team if it was I want to say it was in the hundred and forty, hundred and twenty to hundred and forty million a year for operations. It, jump in if i'm correct me if i'm wrong but i think it was in that order of magnitude okay the uh, order of magnitude is all you can do right now anyway realistically i'm not expecting a, a hard hard number for any yeah. of these questions and that yeah and that number varies depending on the number of tracks or number of trains and um yeah. could you move down to your polling slide or slides So um, what assumptions were given to the people that were asked about this in terms of the cost of a ticket? 
Yeah, Chair, let me explain this a little bit. Um, we've sure. done, we've actually done several pieces of kind of polling and public outreach, obviously, through this very complex planning process. What we're summarizing here is kind of the top one, the online MetroQuest survey. You know, that was an online survey, and yes, it was self-selected. It wasn't meant to be scientific. We just, you know, gauging the pulse of the public, right? right. Um, but then what we did after that is we actually did a statistically significant, we actually hired um, the survey firm that you see, Magellan Strategies and RBI, RBI, and we actually did a statistically significant uh, survey because we wanted to have some kind of weight behind this, um, and we wanted to talk about cost. Um, so team, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we asked about a particular cost of a ticket, but what we did do, and some of the criticism that you can get here is like, well, sure, people like a training concept, but you know, when you tell them how much it costs, when you start talking about some of those financial implications, you know, what does the support look like? And what we're demonstrating here is that, you know, even when we came up with a number of five billion, and that was just sort of a planning number to pull around, um, you know, just a sort of big, scary number, frankly, uh, but something that might be in the range of, of what we thought was realistic at the time. You know, you see that we still have really strong support. People, people still support this project, even knowing that it's going to be expensive. Um, you know, knowing that there's a big cost attached to it, um, they, they're still, you know, statistically significantly in favor of it. I think that's how I'd summarize that. I uh, the the one thing I would say about the polling and and uh, and I appreciate the online stuff is it's interesting but it's not uh, I'd focus more on the R, RBI Magellan surveys. Yeah. If you look at those and if by the time you look at what ongoing operating costs are and and paying off the debt over time and all the other all the other parts you come up with um, what a ticket might cost and. I remember a lot of the work that was done on the idea of rail out uh, on I-70, you know, and, into the mountain communities, and everybody was in favor of it until they found out what the tickets were going to cost, and they found out what the tax implications were. And the concept, and this is what you get with the online survey, everybody loves the idea of having rail up and down, you know, in this corridor, and it is a, it is a highly populated corridor more so even than the I-70 by, by a substantial margin. But you you still come back to the, when you plug the numbers in, you know, when you go to the people for that tax increase uh, and they get to see the whole thing, it's, it's a harder poll to get really good support from. And yeah, so I, and that's, sorry, Chair. I encourage you to get to that second level in, in the polling. It's, and I know you're doing everything you can to get a better understanding of the whole project right now. It takes early early work like that. Rebecca, yeah, it does. Take your hand up. Oh, I was just going to note that I know um, I really appreciate David's time today. I know he has a hard stop. I just wonder if there are, um, we can always come back and talk more about their specific questions. Um, sure. Uh, on the, the possible connections to the work of our committee. Yeah, Elise, uh, would you like to Sure, I, I mean, I think that one of the direct uh, connections with the work of the RTD Accountability Committee is how this relates to um, the RTD responsibility for finishing sure. fast tracks mm -hmm. and, and the lion's share of that, not all of it is Northwest Rail. And I guess, um, I guess two questions. One is when you look at the likelihood of getting Northwest Rail via fast tracks or via front range passenger rail or some combination thereof, I mean, how how realistic, all of this sounds good, but I'm just, how realistic is it that we would be able to um, find the funding both to build this and you know, 120 to $140 million a year is, an enormous operations cost. So I guess that's one question. And the other question, well, we'll start with that. I mean, where are we in the realm of reality, would you say, on this? That's our charge is, is to understand what is viable and, and what the political will and the appetite is. And so I think we had to define what is preferred and then kind of take that out to stakeholders and, and get endorsement from decision makers and from the public and, and their appetite for performance, for um, you know, the, the level of acceptable environmental impacts, for the cost and, and understand where this fits in, in other uh, existing plans. 
So I think those have really been our, our four primary questions. And if we can answer yes to each of those four, then we know that we've got a confidence to move forward. Um, there are a lot of existing plans up and down the corridor that uh, we're very consistent with, but there, there are some deviations. And, and the Northwest Rail, the 55 trains in the same area um, is different than the 24 trains, which the, the Rail Commission envisioned. They have slightly different needs. And so that's where we want to try to find where that win-win might be. And is that part of the Chrissy on funded study in, in the next year where you think you'll be able to sort of hammer through some of those details? That's our that's our hope. And it's working closely with FRA and making sure that um, we're compliant with their federal um, processes so that we can compete um, for federal funding. But all of that also helps us lead into being more prepared um, for if, in case NEPA funding comes along too. Sure. Yeah, and I would I would mention real quick on that. You know, obviously no one wants to count their chickens before they're hatched. And one of the things that we've learned through this work is we need to get it right on the front end in terms of our planning process. We need to be clear about some of these questions you're asking in terms of costs and operations and obviously alignment and so on. Um, but I will say with some caution that there is a lot of excitement and there is a lot of momentum both at the state level and at the federal level. Um, and one example is that Amtrak has said publicly that the Colorado Front Range is one of their top four, if not their you know, sort of most priority corridors across the country where they are interested in expanding. If they can get the funding to do it, they want to put in $2.1 billion in this corridor. So that's really exciting. There's a potential. And again, we'll see where that goes. But again, it, it makes it incumbent on us. Let's let's get this right so that we can be ready to go. And then I guess the other... Oh, um, I just one other question. Um, one of the potential, you know, this is a big issue and we're not going to, the accountability committee is not going to wrestle um, solving the unfinished fast tracks corridors in our interim report. Um, but one um, potential starting place is to suggest that the investigation of front range rail should be looking at the BNSF uh, alignment through Boulder i.e. the Northwest Rail alignment, it is the one that, that shows the greatest ridership and therefore you know, the, the biggest bang for the buck. But for, from RTD's perspective, um, to have an ongoing liability around Northwest Rail and, to, and, and then have front range passenger rail be built somewhere else doesn't make sense. And that whether or not um, we should uh, encourage where I think we're headed anyway, which is that that this effort, the front range passenger rail effort, should focus on that alignment as the, as the alignment for this effort, rather than looking at other alignments further to the east that wouldn't solve um, the RTD unfinished fast tracks um, issue. So I, I guess I throw that out to you for just your reaction to that. I, I have heard RTD say that if they went straight up um, I-25, that that would also check a box for them. But realistically, I don't think from the accountability committee standpoint, that actually solves a problem that we need to, to solve. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, is a, it is a much smaller box than the Northwest Rail in terms of checking boxes. And I think there is, there without, without Boulder in that route, I think there'd be a significant loss of support for the idea of, of uh, this, this front range rail service. Absolutely. And so uh, we were careful not to predetermine a preferred alternative just to kind of keep us NEPA compliant, but in terms of performance and the criteria that teal alignment really does perform the best. So I, I don't want to make any definitive statements, but as we talk with stakeholders, there is that um, predominant view that really that that um, more so than the yellow um, alignment. So I think that it, we're hearing loud and clear that 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 preference. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank both of you for being here today. I think this was really enlightening and something we needed to learn more about. And you've certainly helped us do that. Can we get a copy of this slide uh, set, 
sent to Ron and, and distributed out to the committee. Are you guys okay with that? Yes, we can certainly do that. Great, good. I would appreciate yeah, thank that. You. It's yeah, a chance to really chair. think more deeply about, about this too. Thank you. All right. Well, let's, uh, unless anybody has anything else that they are dying to add, let's uh, go ahead and move on to CARES Act funding in that report. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully that means you can put up those slides. I can, I can share my screen now, uh, but um, I will just take this opportunity to introduce um, Anna Daniger from North Highland, um, the consulting firm. Oh, I see Tanya is here now as well. Sorry, Tanya, I missed you earlier. Um, Tanya and Anna have been working um, uh, as part of the North Highland team as the consultants to the accountability committee. And um, one of the, they've got a couple of tasks that they've uh, been asked to work on on behalf of the accountability committee, largely uh, to support the finance committee's work. Um, so the first item is the review of the CARES Act uh, funding. I will remind everyone that the full accountability committee got a presentation on this on Monday uh, morning this week. So I might ask Tanya and Anna to be a little briefer on that item since I think we're running a little behind schedule this morning and then save a little bit more time for the administrative overhead discussion, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. All right, um, Tanya, are you going to be running a slideshow? Uh, yes, I will. Thank you, right. Ron. I will make you the presenter. And thank you both for being here with us today. We are glad to be here. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, we've been, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Now let me just move into a, a presentation mode. So it's a little bit bigger for y'all. Okay, great. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair and, and to the rest of the uh, finance subcommittee, we're very excited to be here to share with you what we have done um, thus far for the uh, Dr. Cog uh, RTD Accountability Committee. As Ron said, we're gonna start with the CARES Act funding. Um, we'll keep this uh, more brief than our discussion yesterday. Um, but some of this will be uh, this will be a review for those of you who did attend yesterday's meeting. Can um, I make one, one quick differentiation? We are we are the uh, RTD Accountability Committee formed by the governor and the legislature, and we work hand in hand with Dr. Cog, and they do a terrific. It, it has been a great relationship, but we are an independent committee from Dr. Cog, and we're an independent committee from RTD as well. And that isn't uh, real clear in the report, but I talked through that with Ron and he'll have some feedback on that. Oh, you. fantastic. Really Thank you for, for that. Important. Don't mean Thank to be too provincial, but it is an important distinction. Well, us. it is very important distinction, especially when it's going to the legislature, correct? <laughs> Great. All right. So, um, so again, we'll start with CARES Act funding and move along to the administrative overhead review. Um, and we'll pause for questions throughout. Just quickly, you all, you all have met Anna and I um, just now. Um, I do wanna call out our colleague, Derek Pender. He is a workforce um, uh, SME and, uh, 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 sorry, workforce analyst in SME. Um, so he did do a great deal of this work. So I just wanna recognize uh, his contribution to, to both of these projects. Uh, so the CARES Act spending, um, we'll, we'll, we'll take a deeper dive uh, into this, but you know, we were really asked to you know, just take a look at how those funds were used. Um, and then for the administrative overhead, um, we were asked um, you know, to kind of review um, the um, you know, administrative and staffing levels and do some comparisons with other uh, transit agencies. Um, and so with both these pieces of work, uh, we've provided some insights um, that RTD uh, may consider and moving forward. So we'll start with the uh, CARES Act spending. Um, you know, our process here, we did uh, just very quickly, won't go into as much detail as yesterday. We did some discovery, um, gathering some documents and, and doing some research. Um, reviewed the information that, that had been given to us and did some, you know, developed some questions for uh, an interview that we used in the valid, we went through in the validation stage with um, ACME CFO and controller, uh, Mr. Doug McLeod, where we discussed um, the draw, the, the CARES Act drawdowns, um, as well as 
other uh, responses RTD uh, implemented uh, as a result of the COVID impact. And so this, this um, slideshow uh, summarizes the, um, the documents uh, that we provided uh, to, um, to, uh, to Ron. Um, so, you know, our findings here really are that RTD, uh, RTD's use of the CARES Act funding was in alignment with the intentions of the FTA. Um, and we noted that RTD, um, you know, they were balancing the provision of transportation services as well as um, their commitment to the region um, and its own workforce in making funding decisions. And then finally, that um, you know, RTD um, through their own efforts did some 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 work to implement cost-cutting measures um, in response to COVID-19. So CARES Act funding, um, as as you all I'm sure are aware, um, RTD was awarded 232 million dollars, of which um, at the time of this analysis, 208 million had been spent. Um, and the additional 24 million uh, has been earmarked for use by the end of the year. Um, these funds do have to be used by the end of the year and it is our RTD's intention to do so. Um, they do not plan on leaving anything on the table. The makeup of this is largely wages and benefits for both represented and non-represented employees. And then also the um, externally contracted um, transportation, uh, the bus and, and, and rail routes that are, that are contracted externally. In the appendix of the previous slide, you are of the previous deck, you'll see um, you know, this level of detail. I think the only part I really will note out here is that um, you know, the funds were available retroactive to the first date of the known, um, first known uh, case of COVID in the United States. Um, so despite the fact that you know, lockdowns and the impact really started in March, um, RTD was able to get some, some funding uh, for April. Um, so they did take advantage of that. Um, again, they have 10% remaining and, and, and intend to, to use that uh, in its entirety. RTD did look to balance the responsibilities to the region um, as well as its employees. So uh, specifically as it relates to um, you know, the region, making sure that they were a good partner to the region um, and did not react. Um, you know, they had a more measured response to the pandemic. Um, they didn't want to react quickly with drastic layoffs. Um, instead, they wanted to act as a partner to the region and understanding that drastic layoffs would have a, a big impact on the economy, especially if they were not necessary. You know, given the uncertainty of what was known of, of COVID at the time this all began, we all hoped that we would sit at home for a couple of weeks, do some work from home for a few weeks and, and be back to normal. Um, there's a great deal of uncertainty there. Um, RTD also recognized that a reduction in force would impact both the, the loss of in-demand roles, so difficult to fill positions like operators and bus mechanics, and those roles also have a high cost of acquisition in terms of recruitment and training. Um, and so finally, RTD was somewhat limited in what they could do, um, especially in the short term, by their um, collective bargaining agreements with the union. Um, and as we noted, uh, RTA, or RTD did do um, some of their own cost-cutting measures. Um, and as you'll see here, uh, you know, they suspended uh, non-FTA required uh, training. They uh, instituted salary cuts and furloughs as well as a hiring freeze. The hiring freeze remains in place. Um, and as many transit agencies, they uh, also implemented some service cuts. And they put down some capital construction initiatives on hold, things such as resurfacing parking lots. Um, in an effort to, 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 to curb spending. Um, we proposed and we went into these in a little bit more detail yesterday. And so being cognizant of the time, I don't necessarily know that we need to take a deep dive, um, but these are the, the sort of the five areas that, that we, you know, we recommend RTD continue to, to, to look into. And we know um, through the comments that Ms. Johnson made um, on the meeting uh, Monday, that um, you know, these are, are already largely on RTD's radar. If, so, if I can, I'm sorry, I, I, I have to interrupt you now. We're, we, uh, we have some more agenda items that we've got to get to, but I do want to make the point that if you look at page two of four of the report that's attached in this agenda, it does a very good job of summarizing <clears throat> what the <clears throat> findings were. And one of the things we want to do is we want to move that as an executive summary to the beginning of these four pages, because frankly, uh, you know, the governor's staff and uh, and the legislators are really 
busy people and seldom read past the first page. And I want to make sure that we get out in the first page the fact that, in especially that the funding has been spent in alignment with FTE intentions. RTD has got has has done a a balanced job of how that money is being spent, and they've really, in addition to that, worked to implement some other cost-cutting measures. We want to reassure those people, and I believe there's good evidence here to do that, that that money has been spent appropriately. And so, uh, with that, if unless any other members have got questions or comments, uh, we'll need to move on in the agenda to uh, the issues of administrative overhead review. And thank you so much for being here with us for this. Really and glad to do it. Thank you really for having us. Really did a good job on this, and, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and thank you for your comments. We do. We have started a draft of that executive summary. Um, we'll incorporate the feedback you just you've just given, um, and make sure that that's incorporated. I'll well. let Ron take the lead on on directing that. But Ron, as soon as we get that, I want to make sure that we can get this as part of our interim report. And so if you will pass it on to me as soon as we have a good draft and the rest of the committee members as well for their comments. Hopefully on the December 6th meeting, we'll be able to, to decide whether or not we want to push that forward into the interim report and to the accountability committee, but I think we should. Okay, uh, next up is overhead review with Ron. So Ron. Yeah, again, I'll hand this off to Tanya to um, keep moving right into this topic. We'll, we'll skip a beat. All right, yep. sounds great. Thanks so much, Ron. All right, so similar, um, in keeping in time, won't go into too much detail here, but I uh, did want to brief you on our approach to this um, to this work, the administrative overhead. Um, you know, we gathered some data available from RTD that included things such as org charts, median salaries, and, and the like. We also leveraged the National Transit Database a great deal in order to do comparisons um, for other agencies. Um, so we analyzed the data, um, did, did a bunch of uh, analytical ratios and, and compared uh, administrative and operational workforces workforce levels, along with service levels um, with these peer agencies. Um, we met uh, again with, with uh, Mr. McLeod to, uh, no, I'm sorry, that's the other validate stage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, we did meet with some of our own internal SMEs uh, to validate our findings and making sure our, our, our findings were, were uh, in line with what's known within the industry um, and, and more broadly uh, workforce in general. Um, so again, we'll summarize that information in, in these slides here. So just want to quickly level set on some key terms. Um, so when we're talking about administrative staff in this discussion, we're talking about administrative staff, staff as, uh, as defined by the uh, national, by, by NTA or NTD. Um, so we're talking about things such as um, personnel administration and HR. We're talking about uh, procurement, um, finance and accounting and the like. When we're talking about operational staff, we're talking about the staff that it takes to get service out on the on the on the streets or or the rails, right? So this is going to be your operators, um, your vehicle maintenance folks, as well as facility maintenance people. Another important distinction that we want to make up front is um, that salaries and wages, as we refer to them in here, are exclusive of fringe benefits um, and uh, paid time off. So this is simply wages. All right, so um, three key findings again here. We did find that, you know, relative to the spread of the peer agencies, you'll see those peer agencies in a moment, um, RTD does appear to be on the higher end of administrative staff as a percentage of total staff. We also found that when adjusted for the cost of living, um, RTD average salary and wages per administrative employee appears to be higher than most of their peer agencies, though not all of them. But we also found that um, RTD's total administrative salary and wages as a percentage of total operating expenses does appear to be in line with their, with their counterparts. So we'll dig into each of these here. Um, and beginning with that spread that we first talked about, um, that you know, RTD, so we see the spread of, of 7.2 to 14.9 um, of the peer agencies. So MARTA and Atlanta, 
LA Metro. Um, we included LA Metro knowing you all have been looking at them from a governance standpoint and looking at their model. So we thought they were relevant to include. We also included TriMet, Sound Transit, um, Minneapolis, Metro Transit, and Harris County. Um, and that's, um, that's Houston area. Um, so, you know, seeing this spread, we see ITD or RTD on the higher end of the administrative staffing, making up about 14% of the total population. Um, but I think it's important to note that these are just percentages. There's, there's a few things behind this as well, right? So um, RTD does serve the greatest square number of miles um, to any of these comparative properties. So RTD is serving about 2,300 square miles. LA Metro is the next largest agency in terms of geography where they're covering about 1,500 miles. So, you know, the larger geographic area does require uh, a coordination with more municipalities, which is largely an administrative function um, and additional management functions for oversight across the geography. <laughs> RTD also provides more service than its peers and is providing that service to a smaller population. So the density of the RTD service area um, is less than that of these peer agencies. Um, and RTD is serving more annual miles and more revenue miles than all but two, or I'm sorry, annual miles on average more. Um, and then in terms of revenue miles, they're serving more revenue hours um, and uh, more than all but two of those peers. So given the density of, of the region, it makes sense that these metrics would naturally be higher, more space to cover, more miles, that takes more hours. Um, but our RTD is also doing this with a fewer number of employees. We also found that economies of scale may be influencing the transit administrative to operational staffing ratio. So we did take a look at larger transit agencies such as New York MTA and SEPTA in Pennsylvania, um, where we found they have smaller administrative staffing ratios, MTA at 4.3% and SEPTA at 8.4%. So it appears that there could be some, um, you know, uh, that larger agencies have these lower percentages of administrative staff as a percentage of total employees. Um, you know, it's, functional efficiencies are likely easier to be attained for these larger systems. Um, so it's possible that, um, you know, administrative staff to operational staff ratios is higher for systems with fewer employees. And the final point here that we'll make is that personnel count does not necessarily equate to efficiency. So because organizations have different approaches uh, to outsource staff support, so contractors and, and staff augmentation, right, um, administrative roles uh, do not alone indicate operational efficiencies. You know, each geography maintains its own regional culture, um, which accounts for different, um, you know, expectations and, and, and behaviors. So, um, for example, some municipalities may be more litigious than others, um, and that would require additional legal support. Some of these agencies may find it more advantageous to contract that work out, while others may decide to have more in-house counsel. So both of these circumstances can account for differences uh, in the way that a transit agency, um, you know, kind of responds to this administrative function. Um, so different organizations respond to their regional cultures and the manner in which these administration administrative functions are staffed doesn't necessarily indicate an inefficiency. Our second finding um, that, you know, when adjusted for the cost of living, RTD average admin salaries and wages do appear to be higher than their peer agencies. So in doing this review of salary and wages as a total of salary, uh, as a total of salary and wages, admin salary and wages and total um, salary and wages. Um, RTD appears to pay admin staff uh, a higher percentage of total salaries and wages. This does align with the previous finding. You know, it would make sense that a percentage of administrative salaries and wages would be influenced by the total makeup of the administrative employees. Average administrative salaries and wages for employees when, when adjusted for cost of living differences you know, it does appear RTD admins, administrative staff and salary as an average to total administrative staff full time uh, exceeds their peers with the exception of MARTA and Sound Transit. 
So a couple of notes on this. Um, again, when we, we started earlier talking about salaries and wages, you know, this is again, as defined by the, the NTD, um, this, does, this does exclude fringe benefits as well as paid time off. So it's important to recognize that in systems with pensions, um, these fringe benefits can be quite substantial, um, you know, in terms of the proportion of the um, overall compensation package. And that's true particularly for administrative staff. Um, next, the analysis is an average of total salaries and wages and not individual position analysis. Um, so, you know, for the sake of comparison, as we talked about, we, we were using NTD data, making sure we were getting those apples to apples. And so the data um, that, that's used does not provide the level of detail of position by position, nor does it provide function by function detail. Um, so NTD data would include um, everyone from an administrative assistant salary to a full-time lawyer within the Office of General Counsel. So depending on how both offices are staffed and whether certain roles are delivered you know, by full-time employees or contracted employees, you know, this number could shift um, rather dramatically. So our third finding here is that you know, when you look at admin salary, ad administration salaries and wages, um, and compare that to the you know, total operating expenses of the agency, RTD is on par with their comparisons. You see here in the spread, they're at 5.5%, with the average being at 5.3%. Um, so so they're, they're performing quite well in this metric, um, but you know, a couple of notes again on this, and we're, and we're going back again to contracted work, right? So administrative ratios um, you know, can be impacted based on um, contracting out operational functions. So, you know, a lot of times when these functions are um, contracted out, operating functions specifically, it does require additional administrative staff to oversee those contracts. And that's not accounted for um, through the uh, NTD data. Excuse me, jump ahead, all right. Um, and finally, back again to the, to the contrasted piece, um, MTD data does not provide a lens to um, you know, analyze the compensation provided um, to contracted roles. So some transit agencies leverage external contractors for certain higher compensated positions. Um, again, general counsel is a great example, um, but this information would not necessarily be included in the MTD data. So in, in looking forward and, and you know, what, what these findings really show is you know, in order to justify any compensation or staffing adjustments, there needs to be a, a little bit you know, more, um, more investigation in this. Um, one opportunity would be to reevaluate data, the NTD data once uh, the 2020 data is published. You know, RTD has recently announced a reduction in force of roughly 400 positions as a result of COVID service interruptions. Um, and so these positions we know are a combination of administrative and operative, operating positions, but we do not know the makeup of that and the percentage of that. So these staffing percentages will change as a result of that. Um, also, when comparing with other agencies, you know, they're, they're um, experiencing for similar fluctuations and, and both in terms of staffing and service reduction. So a more accurate comparison um, may be reflected in um, NTD data released uh, for 2020. Um, conducting a more extensive compensation assessment would also be rather telling. So, you know, on initial review, we were unable to find many departments sharing duplicative roles. So it's challenging um, in assessing, you know, the uh, internal compensation comparisons. Um, so in order to more fully assess compensation of administrative employees, um, you know, assessing the roles and responsibilities would, would be needed. Um, you know, additionally, you know, level by level peer compensation analysis could better determine if salaries at all levels uh, of the organization, so from executive, managerial, frontline staff, and so on, or is, or is, is that weight of the salary coming from one particular Function or division or, or level within the agency. Yes, hi, Rudd, uh, Mr. Bridges. Yeah, I think we're going to. I think we're going to need to to cut this off. I do want to give our fellow committee, my fellow committee members, a chance to uh, ask quick questions and comment. But I would say one thing that I think would be interesting is to look at 
the assessment that you did and the assessment after the cuts that are coming up to RTD and, and how those numbers may have changed. But that's a, that's a topic for another day. Uh, in the meantime, uh, whoever would like to, uh, to comment or, or whatever, I invite you to do so, the, uh, the committee members. Rebecca? Yeah, I was just I'm sort of wondering, were you able to look into, um, for example, the use of uh, additional consultant support that is often used when there's not sufficient administrative staff? And you, you've kind of mentioned it a few times here, but I'm not sure I quite captured whether that was information you had access to or had a sense of how to compare it. And if that's included, in the administrative bucket or the operations? I guess it's all administrative, but. Yeah, so if I can um, jump in and then Tanya, sorry to uh, uh, bounce back to you, but no, we were not looking at um, that sort of function by function, what is contracted out versus what is in-house. Um, this was looking at uh, um, predominantly numbers of administrative staff um, and then also salaries um, and overall budget. Um, but you know, working in a number of transits, um, we do see dramatic swings, which I think is why we're getting to some of these. You know, hey, if you if you want to um, go deeper in one particular function or a few functions uh, before the changes are made, we would recommend that we work with one transit um, in the Northeast where they literally have every law firm in the city on. Um, under contract with them because that way, and it's a very litigious um, um, uh, sort of um, liberal city for, for uh, lack of a better way to say it. Um, and um, that way, anytime they're sued, they can make sure that they pass the suit to a firm other than the one that's suing them. So they, I mean, you know, they have firms engaged right. both suing them and defending them at the same time. Um, and right. it's a very small general counsel's office. Um, and yeah. they, rely on all of the the law firms in the city um, in other places um, the inclination is to pull all of that in-house another um, transportation entity that we work with in the northeast um, doesn't really use any outside counsel and has exclusively in-house counsel neither we appreciate that it is a complex thing to try to evaluate mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, I, I would say this I, I really don't feel like this is something that's ready to go in an interim report right now I think we really need to to understand the work that you've done here better and understand how the changes that RTD has already taken, the steps they've already taken, may change that picture. I think it's a little unfair to RTD to say, this is where you ranked, because I think there, there have been a number of structural changes there that should be accounted for. Do, do, do we agree about that, not trying to move this into the interim report? Everybody on the committee, raise your hand if you do, or do this if you don't. It doesn't feel ready yet. It really doesn't to me either. Okay. And right. Yes. Just one other comment. I'm pretty sure that the RTD has been scheduled for a compensation study. Um, I believe the RFP went out. As far as I know, that's still on the schedule. You know, there've been so right. many cuts uh, recently that I'll need to double check that, but. Uh, that's been the plan for the very near future here. I can get back to you on that. Please do. Yeah, I think that's a that's important in our what we're trying to do. So the the last real item on our agenda is the uh, preliminary report outline. And so uh, let's move on to that. I don't think there's any any uh, big big news here, but I do know that uh, once again we're we are uh, asking our partners, Dr. Cog, to put together a, a preliminary version of what this might look like, knowing that, that the items that we, pro we either want to or probably will want to move forward. In particular, the, uh, the legislative changes and the um, results of, of the study that we were talking about just prior to this on the CARES Act. And then what we what we will be working on, what we feel like are things that we still have ahead of us. So, Ron, do you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will, um, the full committee did see this outline at its meeting Monday morning. Did want to share it with the subcommittee, um, give you all an opportunity to weigh in. Um, I think we got some good feedback on Monday. Generally, moving in this direction, we'll we'll add some appendices to this report. Um, but the the approach that we're um, anticipating for the um, each of the subcommittee sections of this is, is sort of a summary of the work and research so far within that subcommittee's purview. Um, any sort of, not necessarily findings, but initial sort of thoughts that are short of full recommendations, but sort of some initial determinations or, or uh, res results of some of the research and discussions. And then as um, Rut mentioned, sort of areas for further investigation. Um, and I and I will take this opportunity real quickly to thank Tanya and Anna for for their work. The administrative overhead is a complex assessment. We were not anticipating that this work to date is sort of con con uh, conclusive, but it is ho we hope a good basis for sort of looking forward and identifying areas for further uh, research and review. Any comments from the members? Yes, Elise. Um, I just wanted to say that I think the finance uh, portion of of the finance work of the committee is perhaps the most important or, or will be most, most uh, looked at by the governor and lawmakers. So I think um, trying to flesh out our future to-do list and areas of inquiry will be important. And so um, it will be interesting to sort of start putting together that list and getting some response and feedback to make sure that we're covering that territory pretty um, extensively because there's expectations that we're going to be able to make some recommendations on on how RTD can change its finances and and so there's more work to be done and people will be interested. Very much so. I agree and, and that's something that you know we we did talk about in the last meeting but we we can talk about it again on our December 6th meeting and decide what it is that our priorities ought to be going forward and what it is we're going to try to accomplish in the in the time ahead. Right. Yes, Lynn. Um, some questions have come up in terms of the sort of finalizing of this with respect to the board. And there's a process set out for your final report. It goes to the board. The board either approves it or has, or within 45 days either approves it or sets out reasons not to approve and those sorts of things. And there's public hearing requirements. This is an interim report, which is optional, but it, it is effectively final since it's going to um, the legislature. And uh, so I guess I'm trying to um, put together the best communication plan to take it to the board. Um, and uh, we have taken an earlier draft to the board. I'm not sure if it's changed much. Uh, I, I need to get the latest language. I guess that's my first request. What, where are, do we have final language or pretty close to final language for the legislative recommendations? And um, uh, you know, then kind of what's the process if it's not going to be finished till, Jan till January 11th? Um, and the, the, lang the language is very. If it's not final, it's. I think at this point the language is final, uh, and there are sponsors uh, uh, in the in the House and the Senate who already have a copy, the tweaks were more in the text than they were in the in the suggested changes to legislation. I don't think those have changed in a significant way, other than uh, than some of the things that, that you had raised and that the board had raised before that we took out about uh, uh, carbon, carbon emission stuff. So- okay. Could I add, Lynn, the copy that I sent you right after um, the, the discussion with RTD, after Rutt made the suggestions on removing the, the carbon calculation, that the uh, recommendations have not changed since that document, which was, you know, well over a month ago. Okay. Yeah. So, you've, so think, you've seen it. I don't I think you're getting board surprises the board will. So you think, I'm sorry, Brad. I don't think you'll get any surprises, and I don't think the board will either. No, I don't think so either. I just want to, you know, make sure that uh, we're respecting the process and giving the board, uh, you know, the opportunity to uh, um, By all means. speak again. Um, 
Okay, I'll go back and uh, and confirm that's the one I sent to the board. And, uh, thanks. Of course, thank you. Thanks. Lynn, Lynn, though, just so you know, though, those were not formally adopted by the accountability committee until just this past Monday morning. Got it. And Ron, why don't you send the final version that you have as well to Lynn, just to be safe if, that we really are sure that we've got the, the right stuff. That would be great. Thanks. And copy me and, and Elise as well and, and all yes. of the members of this committee on that email. And that, mm -hmm. I believe, is uh, all that we have for this meeting. Unless anyone else has something they desperately need to raise, we're already a couple of minutes over. And so I'd like to, I would like to uh, suggest that we close our meeting. Thanks, everyone. Have a good holiday. Have a great yeah. holiday. Enjoy the holidays. Holiday. <laughs> You're coming up. You'll be skiing. I will be skiing, yes. <laughs> Happy New Year to you.